Hello everyone, my name is Lucia and I would like to welcome you to the first video in Dunedin Consort series all about opera! Over the next six videos, we are going to take you on a journey through all of the elements that make up the opera world, whether that be singing, dancing, the set, or even technical things like video effects and electrics. So, my first question to you is, what do you think of when you hear the word opera? Do you know what an opera is already? And if you don't, do you have any images that come to mind? Maybe you think of the kind of places that opera is performed in. Or maybe you think of the people who perform in operas. Maybe you've even seen references to opera in other places. But I wonder, did any of you have different images or ideas coming to mind? Huh? Did you know that opera can also include circus, aliens, the inside of a fridge, pyrotechnics like fire, all sorts of backstage technical equipment, videos and projections, even politics? Opera is basically an early version of a musical or even a film. It's made up of a story that is portrayed through music with singers and instrumentalists instead of actors. But as you can probably tell from those pictures that we just saw, it's also a lot more than that. It's a playground for the imagination. Yay! It's a place where the only thing that limits what is possible is the limit of the imagination of the people making the opera. It's a place where not only all the art forms, but also technicians and many other trained people can come together and combine their skills, all with a shared goal of creating something truly spectacular. So, let's go back to the very start. When and where did opera begin? Well, opera started to appear at the very end of the 16th century. And don't forget that the 16th century was actually during the 1500s. Just like we live now in the 21st century, which is actually the 2000s. So when I say the end of the 16th century, I'm actually talking about way over 400 years ago. <laughs> in Italy, the courts, which were full of lords, would have put on plays, and these plays were broken up into small chunks with something called intermedios. Intermedios were also short plays, but they had singing and dancing and many other special effects. One of the most powerful courts in Italy was the House of the Medici, run by the Medici family and they would put on amazing and expensive intermediaries for special events such as weddings. These intermediaries involved dancing and music and they were played in front of the most fantastic staging, which made visual connections between the mythological characters or gods on the stage and the courtly audiences who were watching. The intermedios were made not only to dazzle and wow the audiences at the court by the incredible meeting of art forms, special effects and technology of the day, but also to show the rivals of the court to watch out. Because by putting on these spectacular shows and showing off their wealth, they were also showing how powerful they were and signalling that they should not be messed with. Around the same time, there was a group of poets and musicians living in Florence called the Florentine Camerata and they really loved the ancient Greeks. They wanted to copy the music from ancient Greek dramas as closely as possible but there wasn't any music that actually survived from then. So instead they read descriptions of what the music would have been like which said that people used to sing poetry while an instrument played chords underneath. This type of song is called a recitative and it was really useful because it meant that lots of the storyline could be sung really quickly at the same speed as speaking. Now, instead of breaking up shows like the intermediaries into different sections with some songs, then some spoken word and then more singing, 
they could do whole shows which were sung all the way through. The musicians of the Florentine Camerata started to write new shows like this, stitched together with the sung recitatives. And these were the first ever operas! Most of the music that we will be listening to and learning about in this series is from an opera written by a British composer called Henry Purcell. Even though he lived over 300 years ago, he is still seen as one of the best British composers ever to have lived. He started off by writing semi-operas similar to the Italian intermedios with plays or spoken text joining musical numbers, but he also wrote one full opera called Dido and Aeneas. We are looking at Dido and Aeneas because the Dunedin Consort, the ensemble I work for, are going to be performing Dido and Aeneas in 2021. And not just that, but we've commissioned a famous composer called Erilyn Wallin. And no, she doesn't look like that all the time. To write a sequel to Dido, which is called Dido's Ghost. Dido and Aeneas, the Purcell opera, is a tragic love story where the Trojan prince Aeneas becomes shipwrecked on his way to Italy. And he and a queen from a place called Carthage fall in love. But there are witches that hate Dido and really want her to be very unhappy. So they plan to create a storm where a fake god of Mercury tells Aeneas that he must leave Dido and continue on to Italy. Aeneas has to leave because no one ignores what the gods tell them to do. And after he goes, Dido is so heartbroken that she kills herself and everyone is really sad. The end. Now, Dido and Aeneas is still one of the most popular operas to be written. And one of the reasons it's been so successful for so long is because of the very sad song that Dido sings just before she dies. We'll talk about this song in more depth in one of our later videos, but let's just listen to it now.
It's quite amazing, isn't it? One of the main things that opera tries to achieve is to provoke an emotion in the audience and to show the power of music in doing so. Did you feel anything when you listened to this song? Even though you haven't watched the full opera, could you tell what Dido was feeling? Try to think of three different feelings that you had while you listened to it. The singers in an opera are really important. They have to sing well, but as we've just seen, they are also the actors of the story and getting inside the role of a character is similar for an opera singer as it is for an actor. Audiences love the singers. They go potty for them and for good reason too. Singers are sometimes called virtuosi, meaning that they can do really difficult or virtuosic things. They can sing super high. They can sing super low. They can sing really, really fast. <laughs> And they can sing very, very loudly. Do you remember those opera theatres that we saw at the beginning of this video? Well, opera singers have to sing so loudly that even people at the very back of an opera theatre should be able to hear them without microphones. Why without microphones? Well, this is because microphones and speakers didn't actually exist yet when opera was invented, so nothing could be used to amplify the sound. Every sound that you hear in opera has to be made with the human body and this is so difficult that some people even compare opera singers to athletes. We are really lucky because for the rest of the video we get the opportunity to meet the singer who is playing Aeneas in our performances of Dido and Aeneas and Dido's Ghost. Let's give him a huge round of applause. Hello. My name is Matthew Brooke, and I'm singing the role of Aeneas. What makes you love opera? Okay. The really good thing about opera is that you often rehearse for five or six weeks, sometimes even more, and you become a team with your singers. You've learned the music off by heart before the first rehearsal, and uh, you all come with different ideas and you think i think i know what this character is but once you get together as a team the director might have different ideas so you have to sort of work from stage one together and i really like bouncing ideas off the directors and off the singers and then of course you have this coming together of costume makeup lights and different sets and the orchestra of course it all comes together 
and uh, it's my job to really tell the story. Everybody else has put the work on to make sure I look good and, and that I've had good musical training and that I've had uh, all the right light cues and I know where to point and when to come off and when to move and when not to. And when it all comes together, that's the thing I really love about opera. What is your favourite character to sing? Right. Well, there's a couple. It's hard to choose between the two. Uh, there are roles that I've done quite a lot. One of them is Polyphemus. And he is a giant who has one eye. He's a cyclops. So imagine those eyes not there and a big eye in the middle of his forehead. And he does look a little bit like a monster. And he is a bit of a monster because he really wants Galatea, the sweet shepherdess, all to himself. And another role is another one by Handel, actually. And he is the King of Scotland. Yes, now in the opera Ariadante, I play the role of the King of Scotland. And uh, that's a great role as well because um, it covers quite a lot of emotions. What's the hardest thing you've ever been asked to do in an opera? Well, quite a few things came in my mind about this subject. One was that I had to uh, do an opera in Paris, which involved me dancing, and I was asked to do a waltz. Now, you may watch Strictly Come Dancing, and you see them pulling off these fantastic dancers after only a week's lessons. But I can tell you, it's, it's really, really tricky. Also, in another opera, I had to get used to wearing very high heels and a cape. Can you imagine uh, boys having to wear high heels? And um, it wasn't easy, I can tell you. So how you girls manage it, I don't know. But I had to try and wear these heels. And uh, on this stage we had, it was called, it was a rake stage. So if you imagine this is the front of the stage, the, the stage was on about that sort of angle. So wearing heels coming down this hill was quite fun. And my, I got my, my ankles became very strong. Wow, thank you Matthew for telling us all about what it's like to sing in an opera. And thank you all for watching today. I hope you've had fun learning all about opera. And don't forget to tune in next week when you'll be meeting Emily, who's going to be talking all about the stories in opera. Bye for now.